Uh, so thanks for having me. So uh, this task of this uh, paper have been work with uh, have been made with Jean Donizo at the uh, Motivational Brain Behavior and as you mentioned in the Paris Brain Institute. So to start easily, um, uh, the start, uh, the beginning point of this talk is the idea that physiological constraints uh, shapes neural circuits and the way we process information and ultimately shapes how we behave. Uh, a prime example of this would be the idea of efficient coding proposed by Barlow in 1961, which is about, which states that given that neurons have limited range uh, to fire and to respond to an input, they should select which information to keep and which information to filter out. Evidence for this uh, theory has been found in the flies vision neuron by Lothlin, in monkeys value neuron by Kobayashi, and more recently in the bias of human uh, decision by Polanya. But this kind of uh, physiological constraint is kind of hard to analyze uh, because first, they are not instrumental at all to a given task, let's say a decision task. Uh, the brain would be better without such constraints. Uh, and in a way, and uh, there are several um, biological scenario behind them. There, are, there could be several uh, way to implement plasticity to account for efficient coding. So in this work, what I'm trying to do is to characterize uh, such biological constraints and how they affect neural decision process. So I do this uh, through the joint analysis of uh, artificial neural network activity and bold signal. So we will, I will train a neural network model on the behavior of subjects based to a task, extract the, info, the activity of the uh, units of these neurons and build a similarity matrix comparing trial by trial the activity of each of these uh, neurons. I'll do the same for the uh, fMRI scan and compare the two. So in this, uh, I'm following a very classical uh, model-based approach. Uh, my model will be first, well, the ANN I just told you about with uh, bounded activation, such as uh, Gaussian or sigmoid function, and with two additional physiological constraints, which would be on one side avian plasticity, which is simply the idea that if units co-activate, their connection will strengthen. And the second idea is range adaptation. It's a dynamical version of efficient coding, if you want. We just we simply state that when a unit responds to an input, brings no information about the input, the uh, firing function of the units will adapt to bring more uh, information. I will, I'm applying this approach to uh, the experimental data of Botvinnik Nezer uh, 2019, which is a very simple task where uh, participants are asked to either accept or reject a uh, mixed gamble where there are 50% chance of winning a given amount and 15% chance of losing this amount. Classically, this uh, kind of tasks are analyzed through a neuroeconomics model which is, or just a behavioral model, let's say, which is just a logistic function apply on a linear combination of uh, gain and loss, plus a given bias. And uh, the hallmark of this uh, approach is to have, is to define an indifferent point where the model predicts that the subject will basically don't mind accepting or rejecting, but in fact, they still decide, but the model is completely blind to this part to this input. First thing we show is that by using six type of uh, network, a network with only Gaussians, only sigmoid Gaussians with range adaptation, sigmoid with range adaptation, the same for avian plasticity. All these networks still are completely deterministic, but uh, manage to uh, exceed the performance of the logistic model. And especially around this so-called uh, indifference spots. Then uh, we went, we used this model to look at the bold signal of uh, the subject 
in uh, a bunch of different regions, in the motor uh, area, the visual area, the singular area, the orbitofrontal cortex, insula, amygdala, and striatum, extracted the similarity matrix and compared them to the similarity matrix of the network doing the same task as the subject and answering the same way. And what we found was that uh, only the Abian network here, shown here uh, managed to relate to uh, brain activity and not range adaptation network and not logistic or static network. And we also devised a model comparison uh, technique, a model selection technique, sorry, uh, to statistically assess that uh, search region behave in an Abian way. Then we tried to see if we could uh, go a bit further and explain uh, behavioral difference between the subjects. So, and more precisely, the choice inconsistency of the subject. So typically the, the decision that goes be uh, against the logistic model uh, prediction. So we, extra we built uh, an avianness score for each of these regions, which is simply the added value of using uh, um, a Nebian network uh, versus an, uh, a default a static network to describe uh, the similarity matrix, the geometry, if you want, of the representation in these regions. And we managed to do this. We managed to predict the choice inconsistency of the subject, and uh, especially with uh, a contrast between the left amygdala and the right striatum, and a contrast based on the uh, Ebianness of uh, sigmoid model. So to wrap up uh, in this work, I've shown that biology constraint can uh, be discriminate, discriminated by uh, the mean of an RSA analysis. Such uh, artificial such constraint artificial network uh, explain away some incoher incoherent choice without uh, using the idea of noise of er or error. Uh, we can find traces of this uh, constraints in uh, the bulk signal, and uh, we can use this trace to understand behavioral differences. And last but not least, all this result has been replicated in uh, the second group of uh, this study. Thanks for your attention. I'll be happy to have questions. Thank you so much, Jules. Uh, that was great. Um... Now we are open to have a question and answer. If you want to ask a question, write it down in Q&A or chat. Uh, thank you again. Uh, and I see that your paper also is available on BioCup if somebody want, if everybody can check it online. Um, I have a question before people ask this or ask a question. So what is the structure of this uh, uh, CNN that you are using? Like how I'm, you make it simple? I'm not really using CNN. I'm using very simple uh, shallow network, and uh, which are composed of just two layer. One layer that receive the gain, one layer that receive the loss, and as the first layer is split into two uh, different parts to uh, ray to give uh, a population cutting of the inputs. And then uh, there is a computational layer that actually does the combinations of these two layers. So you have like a three layer, a fully connected network, right? Exactly. I see, I see. Well, and uh, yeah, go so ahead. except for the, how the uh, inputs enter the network. Right, right, right. There are two inputs. Okay. And then um, to uh, use the RDM here, and compare it to the fMRI data set, the bulk, the bulk data set you showed, you use the same architecture to compare. Uh, yes, it's for all the six networks, the only thing right. that differs is either to use a Gaussian uh, activation function on both layer or a sigmoid on both layer. And then you can also add uh, the uh, an Abian modulation of this uh, intermediate weight of the weight between the two layer or uh, a dynamical range adaptation of the uh, sensitivity parameter of the second layer. Oh, so so I saw that there is a parameter for Hebian. Uh, where is that parameter? 
that you're saying uh, heaviness of that. Uh -huh. Yes, here the heaviness is just a, a dynamic modulation of a static weight. So here you would have, uh, this would be the effective weight used by the network, right? which is composed of a static classic part. And uh, so here's the S then just for a sigmoid to bound it between zero and one. <clears throat> And an, an activation part, an avian activation part that will grow if to um, if the input and the output are similar. So this is a term that um, dynamically computes the covariance between an input neuron and the output of the uh, either Gaussian or sigmoid. Oh, that's interesting. And um, can you also go to the slide that you were showing the the comparison when it changed the heaviness. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, this one? The, uh, so you had the curve that you had the heaviness and. Oh, some... the behavioral one. Yes. Right, one? right. Yeah, yeah, this one. Uh, the the right one, right? Uh, so this shows that at the. So how do you explain this one? It just shows that some middle it goes high and then down. So first, the, the, you have explanation for that. Mm -hmm. Yes, the, the logistic part here. Let Let's start with the logistic curve. It's just the idea. The it just reflects that around the uh, indifference point, uh, people either accept or uh, reject a gamble with the same difference or weighted difference between gain and loss. So, and I interpret the fact that all curves look a bit like a bit the same. All curves show a bell shaped uh, form, if you want. Uh, uh, to me, only reflects that uh, uh, this so this indifference point uh, actually reflects the point where people where subject just don't know and either accept or reject. Uh, but what is um, what's striking to me here? is that there is a quite significant increase or, or decrease of this inconsistency as soon as you consider uh, a temporal dynamic and a nonlinear dynamic in the decision model. Yeah, it's very interesting. Uh, and um, I see that it's uh, consistent with uh, different type of networks, like different sigmoid function or uh, parameters uh, that we have. Yes, different kind of network. There is also ah. a, a bit of trivial thing in this result because yeah. uh, just simply because the network have way more parameters than a logistic model. Right. Yet, yet they have exactly the same inputs. Uh, they, which can be discussed for the uh, model with temporal dynamics. But it's all networks still uh, provide a deterministic function from input to output, from uh, gain and loss level to decisions. Thank you so much, Jules. That was great talk.